two. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the city and county of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the February 26, 2024, Dr. Cog Task Meeting at 1.31 p.m. This is an in-person live streaming meeting format and members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that your type name reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak to use the raise hand button to, raise, um, to ask a question or comment on an item. If you have any technical questions, please direct those to staff in the chat box and please use the raise hand feature to answer any question, ask any questions. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic and make sure the light is on and your microphone is on when you are preparing to speak, speak directly into the microphone. Please announce your name and your representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. During the business agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may only speak during public comment. And right now, Dr. Cog is sitting around the sign-in sheet, so please do sign in. And at this time, I will ask the TAC members and alternates in person to introduce themselves. Okay. Uh, we'll start over here on this side of the room. Go ahead. Brody. Yeah, sorry, Brody. Thanks. Uh, Brody Ayers. A, a, a aviation special interest seat. Thanks. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Sorry, Josh Schwank, Dr. Cog staff. Selma Lenakis, Lafayette. Jennifer Hillhouse, City and County of Denver. Jimmy Houston, seat our region four. Uh, Justin Schmidt, City of Lone Tree, representing Douglas County. I'm Rice, uh, Douglas County and Castle Rock. Matt Williams, alternate from Douglas County. Bill Soroy, RGD. Dean Sanson, City of Boulder. Michelle Riccio, Adam County. Chris Gahan, CDOT Division of Transportation Development. Uh, Brad Rivera, non-motorized special interest. John Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Always pleased when the new members can figure out the microphones better than those of us who've been at the table a while. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog staff. Frank Bruno, VM Mobility Services. Overstein. Hi, good afternoon. Sean Poe, City of Commerce City, representing Adams County. Jeff Boyd, Housing Interest Seat. John Ferruzzi, City of Arvada, uh, Jeff Galternet. Kent Mormon, City of Thornton, Adams County. Alex Hadright, Boulder County. Jeff Dankenbring, Rapo County, City of Centennial. Good afternoon, Matt Callison, City of Aurora, Rapo County. Mike Whitaker at Lakewood, Jeff Coe. Kevin Ash, Weld County, Town of Frederick. Jessica Micklebust, CDOT, Region 1. Maria DeAndre, City of Wheat Ridge, Jeff Coe. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Brent Soderlin, City of Littleton, representing Arapahoe County. That's our Arapahoe County Alternative. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And for those of you that have um, name tags, if you could point them towards me a little bit, that would be great so I could see your name. Perfect. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and at this time, um, we'd like to turn it over to Jacob Rieger to introduce um, some new members. Thank you, Chair Grant. So we have um, three new members today that I wanna recognize, and I know we've got some uh, other faces as well, but let me start with Michelle Riccio, did I get it right? From Adams County, um, brand new member, so welcome, Michelle. Um, and then we have two special interest seats that we've been working to fill, and we do have those folks, uh, one of those folks today. Um, Brad Rivera um, is our new non-motorized uh, transportation representative, so welcome, Brad. Uh, we also have an equity seat representative, that's Angie Rivera Malpietti, who many of you know is a former RTD board director and Northeast Transportation Connections. Um, she's on a plane right now, but she sends her well regards, and she uh, should be here next month. Um, I do see some folks that um, either maybe we're meeting in person for the first time or kind of this is their first TAC meeting, even if they've been on the committee for a bit, um, particularly some alternates. So if this is your first or second in-person meeting, would you raise your hand? 
just so we can recognize you and say hi to you. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Chair Grant. Thank you, Jacob, and welcome, Michelle. Welcome, Brad, and welcome to Angie. Um, now we will move on to public comment. We will now open the meeting for public comment, and comment is limited to three minutes. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine, and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. And staff will unmute you, and you will have um, three minutes to speak. We'll, um, after that, we'll ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. And as a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in discussion regarding each agenda item. At this time, do we have any public comment? First, we'll check online. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. We'll give it a second, but I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. Any public comment in person? Just give it a moment here. Seeing none, the public comment period is closed. The next meeting, uh, next um, item on the agenda is the meeting summary from the January 22nd, 2024 uh, meeting summary. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about that meeting summary? Wonderful. Uh, seeing no um, questions or comments or corrections, um, the meeting summary will stand as posted. Moving on to our first action, first and only action item for the day. Uh, this will be item number four in your packet. This is the community-based transportation planning program selection recommendations, attachment B in your packet. And at this time, I will turn it over to Nora Kern, manager of the sub area and project and planning program. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'm excited today to be talking about our community-based transportation plan planning program and our first recommendation for projects for the uh, set-aside version of that program. So a quick recap, um, the community-based transportation planning was, uh, we piloted it about a year and a half ago, and we have since formalized this program as a transportation improvement program. So in the tip, there's two and a half million dollars, and we have decided to split that into two two-year cycles, with around a million and a quarter um, to be spent each cycle. So this is a technical assistance program. So Dr. Cog is maintaining the funds and then working with member governments and nonprofit organizations to help um, focus, do these plans. Um, and the plans are focused on improving mobility for historically disadvantaged or underserved populations in the region. So we have uh, completed our selection process. We had a letter of interest window at the end of last year. It was a two month period. Um, it was a fairly simple letter of interest. Um, we then formed a selection panel, which included several Dr. Cog staff, both from the transportation planning side, our community, communications and marketing team, and from the regional planning division. And then we also had um, Chris Quinn from RTD and Marsha Nelson from CDOT. And so we were evaluating each of the letters of interest um, based on a number of factors. Um, first was alignment with MetroVision, alignment with the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, the community need, oh, how ready the project and the team were to potentially move forward, and then planning need. And there's actually one missing, I realize, which is um, the um, description of the planned community engagement and kind of the, the thoroughness of that. So during our letter of interest period, we received 10 letters of interest, which you can see kind of summarized here. Um, and they, we did request an estimated budget range. Um, so you can see those at the right. And after our selection panel, um, we reviewed, scored all of the letters of interest, conversations with um, three of the respondents. And we are recommending five of the 10 programs for funding. So you can see those five are the, the top five in not, not highlighted in gray. Um, and then we have a recommended budget, which you can see a couple of these are slightly different than the budgets that were submitted. Um, and I will note that these are draft because of the way this program is set up. Um, we just requested a letter of interest. We don't have a full scope of work for these projects yet. So if these projects are selected, we'll then work with the um, 
either government or nonprofits that submitted the project to really flesh out the scope and make sure everything looks good. So with that, I do have a motion. I'm also happy to take any questions if there are any. For that presentation, Nora. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the TAC? Mr. Uh, Kent Mormon, please. Uh, yes, I'll, I move that to recommend that to the Regional Transportation Committee funding five community-based planning projects through the first two years of the community-based planning program set aside as recommended by the Selection Committee. Thank you for the motion, Kent. Is there a second? I'll second. Sean Commerce. Thank you, Sean Poe. Thank you for the second. Um, do we have any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Great, yeah. thank you. And that concludes our action items for the day. Um, the next item on the agenda, these are discussion items with no action attached to them. This is item five in your packet, the Colorado Freight Plan, attachment C. And I will hand it over to um, Cole Netter to a uh, senior transit planner to introduce this topic. Hello everyone. My name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's senior transit planner and I work on maintaining and updating our current freight plan and also participate in statewide freight planning efforts on behalf of Dr. Cog, uh, which what we are going to be talking about a little bit today. Uh, over the past year, uh, CDOT Freight Mobility and Safety Branch has been conducting workshops, research, and outreach to update the Colorado statewide freight plan. And they will be presenting today on some key priorities drawn from that plan uh, how they align with state and federal goals, and then how they conducted their overall planning process as well. And this update is a bit timely for us, as we at Dr. Cog are also beginning the process of updating our own regional freight plan. Um, so you guys can expect to see a little bit more of me at these committee meetings coming up in the future, but also keep in mind our own freight plan during their presentation and what you wanna see in our own plan going forward. Um, CDOT is the standard of freight planning in our state, and it's great to hear from them today, specifically Erica Denny and Craig Hurst, both, both freight planners at CDOT. Turn it over to both of you. Good afternoon. My name is Craig Hurst. I'm the manager of CDOT's Freight Mobility and Safety Branch. I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Erica's going to do her best to uh, give you a summarized version of a 350 plus page freight plan. Um, so bear with us. We're going to high level uh, quite a bit. Um, the key thing to point out is that the Federal Highway Administration has put out 17 key focus items for every state to plan for. Um, some, some major changes is we expect one and a half times more trucks uh, in Colorado by 2040. And so um, no, we need to plan for that. And uh, we're constantly planning for infrastructure improvements on the state highway system. And we love to help, um, you know, groups like Dr. Cog, but all of the, the local uh, towns and counties that you guys represent, we're always here to help. Um, this is our entire team. So, um, you know, we'll do as best as we can to help, but it's me and Erica. And so, um, again, we're happy to help, but Erica's going to go through maybe uh, in 15 minutes, like I said, a 350-page um, plan. So feel free to ask questions at this time. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. My name is Erica Denny, and as Craig has already stated, I'm the freight planner within CDOT, working hand in hand with him every day. Uh, as he stated, this is going to be high level. This is, we kind of joke, you know, when we're giving presentations, what level are we given? The 5,000, 10,000 foot? This is about 100,000 foot view. So please just keep that in mind. Happy to ask, answer questions, have sidebar conversations afterwards as well if you wish to know any more into the detail of the weeds of this 350 page document that we've sent in. So here we go. Start with a freight plan purpose. So first thing to note, this is not a plan that goes out and identifies different projects. 
This is a policy document that tries to give kind of a scope of how we want to operate as a state as a whole within the process of freight movement and freight uh, operations. So we're not identifying specific projects. We're not going into that kind of a detail in this type of freight plan. The goal is to be able to keep it high level so that we can then point to projects throughout the next four years while this plan is in place to be able to apply for funds to be able to help put towards these different programs. So by doing a data-driven and stakeholder-informed approach, we've tried to look at all the different goals that we have to be able to hit. That includes federal goals. There's 17 different key items that the feds require that we touch on. We also have the Colorado uh, wild, wildly important goals, WIGs, as you may have heard, within CDOT. And then we also have our own freight mobility and safety branch goals that quite honestly, all kind of align together conveniently. You can kind of put them in different buckets. So that's how do we tried to approach it and take a look at various different things. So as we've put them within our branch, it's safety, security, mobility, maintenance, economic vitality, and sustainability and, resili and resiliency. It's kind of high level buckets. You can put a lot underneath them, but it's how we've tried to structure to be able to hit all the goals necessary to make it work for all involved. We've done a lot of engagement uh, over the last year working through this plan. We've done all sorts of conversations via a public webinar. We've done working group where we've had more of a broad but select group to come in and have discussions that we hope to have more dialogue with. We've worked closely with the Freight Advisory Council to which we help secretary within the CDOT. Uh, we've got great relationships within industry as well as different governments uh, within the state. So by working with all of these along with regions, trying to get an idea of what are the issues, what are the overarching things that we can try and approach as a state, as a whole, for this program. So that's what we've been after. A number of different public outings all over the state. Again, this is everywhere, but we did have a number of different uh, you know, events that we attended. There was one in Sheridan that's within the Dr. Cog region on September 30th, I believe, that we attended to have more of that one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the general public. We've also worked quite a bit with different government agency and uh, nonprofit groups for disproportionately impacted communities. We did have a survey that went out for the public and we posted it online, try to get it out best we can everywhere we could. We had that both in English and in Spanish to try and cover as much of the community as we could to try and have that perspective. Those survey, survey participants, we thought pretty successfully, covered a good portion of the state, which can be a big challenge. A lot of it is kind of within the Denver Dr. Cog region, but we did get some spread out, which is always good to have that bit of perspective that we may not know living in this area. We're going to go into kind of these different buckets and just, again, high level what we've touched on. So as far as the Dr. Cog region, we've zoomed in on some of the data that we've looked at from a state perspective, but this is what's within the Dr. Cog area. This is crashes with commercial vehicles by per mileage basis by VMTs. So you can kind of see the orange is the heaviest, the green is the lightest, and if there isn't anything, it means there wasn't anything, which is a win. Another thing, different uh, safety operations items. So you've got everything from chain stations to pullouts, weigh-in motions, runaway truck ramps, et cetera. So these are what we have to have for trucking specifically for safety it can potentially be used for others, but really was put in place for the freight industry. At grade crossing incidents, you can see the red dots where there have been issues between a commercial vehicle and a railroad. Some of the strategies that we've gone over, uh, there's all sorts of them that we could go into detail with, but one of the big wins that we've had is the Mountain Rules campaign. I don't know if you guys have heard about this or not, but it's a safety video series that we've put out to the general public on YouTube talking about how to safely plan your trip through Colorado. A lot of commercial motor vehicle drivers, obviously they have to get their CMV somewhere, however, or CDL, sorry, somewhere, but they may not have exposure to mountainous terrain. Even if they're from the Southeast, they may think, oh, I know how to drive through the mountains until they get here and go, oh boy, this is crazy. What do you mean I have a whole nother pass to get up over Vail? What do I do? So the idea was to get in front of these guys and give them a bit of a tip. Now, we're the government. We're not trying to step in and tell them what they're doing or how to drive a truck, but we want to give them pointers. We want to help them plan their trip. We want them to know what's ahead of them. So we've created this, and it's really gained quite a bit of momentum. For example, we had Amazon send it out to 53,000 of their drivers that are all owner-operators just within the region. 
one hit. We thought that was a huge win. So we're continuing that campaign from a safety perspective, going in, working with State Patrol and CMCA to try and hit these very specific uh, kind of target topics for the safety standard. Truck parking is another thing. Uh, you know, we, we need to try and continue to find new ways to allow for drivers to have a safe place to park. We're coming out with our phase three truck parking study. We're going to kick that off here soon and continue to try and help promote that. Mobility, kind of high level. Uh, you can see the bottlenecks. Cost of congestion per day within the state is pretty high. Congestion costs a lot of money for anybody trying to move around. Bottlenecks, ATRI, which is a major tra trucking specific uh, research institute, came out saying that there are four of the top 100 bot top bottlenecks in the country within the state of Colorado. So naturally something that we pay very close attention to and try and be come up with creative ways. How do we help alleviate it? Easier said than done, but always something to watch. Mobility strategies, there's a lot of different things we're excited to be able to tap into as we go into the future with this freight plan, but you've got data that we're always going to be looking at and how do we how do we read it and help share it with the industry? How do we help it share it amongst ourselves to make things as efficient as possible with the limited availability of resources that we may have? Maintenance, uh, another quick glimpse at some of the data that we're looking at. Vertical clearance for bridges is a big deal. Uh, within our department, we also have all of the oversized overweight permitting that, go, that applies and any bridges that start to struggle with any weight, naturally that throws a flag in our world to try and avoid. Drivability life, that's affecting everybody. I know nobody wants potholes. Reality to some degree until we can come up with other solutions. Where do we need help first? Maintenance strategies. One of the big wins we've had recently that we're going to continue to do is the Timber Bridge retrofit program where we've gone out and spent a fraction of what it would have cost to replace a bridge to be able to help uh, put strengthening the girders underneath these bridges in order to elongate their life cycle. Including with that is the ability to then put these oversized overweight trucks back on those bridges and cut down on the mileage that they're having to travel to get to destination. Economic vitality. This one's always very interesting to me. So I come from the trucking in industry. I come from freight. My family owns a trucking company here in Commerce City, Colorado. And so it's a little bit of one of those, I've always known it, but I didn't realize that other people didn't. Colorado is a consumer town, consumer state, consumer everything. We don't produce near as much as we bring in. And to actually see it in numbers has always been fascinating to me. And with this, you can see 7.32 million tons coming into the Dr. Cog region specifically uh, with a $130.6 billion value. And there's only 81.6 going out, billion dollar value going out. Not saying it's bad, it's just an interesting thing to look at uh, from this kind of perspective. And of the entire state, this region represents two thirds of all of the state commodity flows. You can think, okay, yeah, that makes sense. We've got more people, but still very, very interesting to look at and be able to watch. Vitality strategies, um, you know, we will continue with what we started after the last freight plan of Colorado Delivers. We plan to use this to try and help educate and promote freight movement and freight planning throughout the state. Previously, we helped start the very first CDOT-driven uh, apprenticeship program that we um, kicked off working with industry that we then handed over to Adams County to continue to develop to try and get more truck drivers in the seats of trucks. I think a lot of you have probably heard about the truck driver shortage that we have in this nation globally. It's not just here, uh, but we were trying to step in and find ways to help support to resolve that issue. Sustainability and resiliency, uh, again, more data just to kind of look at. On the right-hand side, kind of interesting, wild animal involved truck-related crash distribution. That's one of the 17 key items that the feds wanted to see. We as a state have done a phenomenal job in the past up to this point and will continue to do so with our wildlife mitigation. So kind of interesting to look at uh, grand scale of things. That's pretty limited number. We will and will always continue to work with the uh, office. Oh, Office of Innovative Mobility, as well as the Energy Office, to try and help with the clean truck strategy moving into the future. The other things that we're looking at is what can we do today? What can we do that's a little bit faster? Trying to get electric or potential hydrogen trucks out there is going to be a bit more of a long game. There's a lot more to go into it. How can we get wins sooner? The bridge program that I referenced a few minutes ago is an example of one of those. If you can cut 140 miles out of a truck that's running four miles to the gallon at best, 
that's a huge win sustainability-wise. Cuts down on emissions more than most anything else can overnight. So we continue to look for different ways to be able to emphasize that and find those low-hanging fruit wins until we can have this new technology slip in. Freight investment plan. Why are we doing this freight plan? It's all for a National Highway Freight Program. That's the federal dollars that we are applying for to try and put towards our different projects here within the state that are freight related. Thus far, since the FAST Act started this program, uh, we've had $179 million invested within the state of Colorado that we've tried to spread out as best we can to try and help service as much of the freight industry as possible. All of these different buckets go into really the three key emphasis areas that we are taking away and putting into this freight plan over the next four, four, four years. That's truck safety, freight operations, and clean transportation. Truck safety, pretty easy. Keep everyone safe. I don't care if you're in a truck, you're in a passenger car, you're on your bike, you're walking, get home safe. How do we do that? How do we help trucks to be able to do that? How do we help trains to avoid any type of collision along the tracks as well? Freight operations, how do we, how do we help make the freight industry more efficient? How do we get them from origin to destination safely and efficiently in the best way that we possibly can from our side of things? And clean transportation, how do we try and help this environment? How do we continue to be sustainable, but yet still efficient in our movement of goods without getting in the way? Next steps, this is kind of the timeline that we've been on. Right now, we are in that January to March. We have started our next call for projects for fiscal year 24 and 25 NHFP funds. We have the regions that are working on their applications now with the um, Presentation starting in April, both to an internal stakeholder group as well as the Freight Advisory Council to try and help separate out what this what funding we can give to these projects within the state. With that, that was a lot. I'm sorry if I went over. Are there any questions? Thank you, Thank you Erica, for that 100,000 foot overview of the freight plan. Appreciate it. Are there any questions or comments from the TAC? Matt Mormon. Uh, yeah, is your data such that it can easily be transferred to Dr. Cog for the area that that is a Dr. Cog area, their regional transfer freight plan? Uh, the national data set that we purchased can be shared, but there are stipulations around that. It's not cheap, and I think they want to keep it that way. And so we're, I, we're happy to participate and give what, exactly what you ask for, but it's not as easy as sending the file. Uh, Mike Silverstein. Yes, thank you, and, and great presentation. Uh, you focused um, on um, kind of the highway side. Um, what uh, what does the plan contain regarding rail and and air freight? Oh, we we partic oh, we have the air freight participate, and we're really good at moving mail in Colorado. Um, but we don't have any freight specific airports here. Um, and then rail has its own plan. So we have a state freight and passenger rail um, plan that we worked obviously hand in hand with the division of transit and rail to make sure that we don't have any conflicting or anything like that. But um, both class one railroads and uh, several short line railroads participated in this discussion, but a lot of the data and the details of what's going on that, um, with them occurs inside that state of uh, freight and, tra and passenger rail plan. Sorry, that's a mouthful. But I, I do see that becoming far more blended in our day to day work um, where we're, we're focused as much on freight rail as maybe our division of transit and rail is because their main focus is on pass passenger rail. Um, but we are always looking for opportunities such as up in Hudson, um, BNSF's developing new rail yards out there on the I-70 corridor, there's a new rail yard and looking for those multimodal uh, transition opportunities is something that the states, we kind of have our hands in, but rail is always interesting because we have zero ownership. And so it's just a, uh, a little bit harder to um, participate with because you have to establish a pretty strong uh, private public partnership to get something like that going. Okay, thank you. And, and one more if, question if I could ask. Um, you 
you're focused on um, clean transportation a little bit. Um, how do we find out more? Uh, that's my area of uh, interest. And where would I uh, go to either participate or, or to, uh, to learn more? So Michael King at CDOT is in our Office of uh, Innovative Mobility. He runs our electrification program, and he has several people on his team, so not just him, but Michael King is um, at least our go-to. Uh, Kay Kelly is um, the director of our Office of Innovative Mobility. She's also a great um, person to reach out to, and she can direct you to the right people. But um, Tom Pacheco does our electrification projects. Um, so there, there are several folks, and we're happy to make those connections for you if you want to reach out. And um, I think they're doing great work as well. Well, thank you. I, I know them well, so thanks. Matt Lerman as well with the Energy Office is also really being kind of out in front of all of this as far as trying to get the electrification installation plan. And Very good. Thank you. Jeffrey Boyd. Yeah, as you mentioned, the shortage of truck drivers. Uh, the one question I have is I had a friend that was a longtime diesel mechanic, and most of the friends that he worked with were retiring. Where are, do you have any data about the mechanics that are needed to maintain these vehicles? Not for the freight plan per se, but that is absolutely something that the industry is up against right now. Um, it's something that is of concern and similar to future truck drivers being concerned of the autonomous vehicle potential and being out of a job. There are a lot of mechanics concerned about the electric truck standpoint and there being so few parts that they also may be out of a job. So there's a bit of an uphill battle and education aspect from that standpoint. We didn't really tap into that within the freight plan. That's a little bit of outside of our scope, but something that we do hear about and talk with the industry about frequently. Thank you. Here. Um, thank you, Erica. I a tough, tough duty to try to summarize a 300 page report down to this presentation, but really good information to um, for you and Craig, I, um, I, I noted the commodity flows information in particular, which is really interesting. Um, and I know that it's, it's stated that it's for all modes. Where would we find the breakdown by mode, both by uh, tons and value? Because um, obviously, a lot of rail carries a lot of heavy stuff, doesn't always sort of have the same value as maybe some of the lower weight materials that flow through air freight, but can represent a pretty significant value of all of the commodities in and out of the state. So I'd be interested in finding out where we can get that. And then before you answer an editorial comment that uh, it looks like this region accounts for two thirds of the state's commodity flows, which should not be lost on us. And the importance, I know we have a lot of statewide conversations about balancing the right investments around the entire state system. And we obviously need to make sure that we have good access to where a lot of the, particularly the agricultural goods are produced. But ultimately, I think this is a testament to the fact that most of that has to flow in one way or the other through this region, so we can't neglect the regional system to make sure that those commodities can get in and out of the rural parts of the state. Uh, that's important. And then my last point, just for the benefit of, I know you're aware of this, but for the committee that our regional freight plan update um, and will kind of build on the good statewide work and the statewide uh, freight plan, but get into much finer grain of detail. Thank you for the comments. Um, and to answer the question about as far as where to find the data, we use TransSearch. It's a federally collected data source. It's not perfect, but it is probably the most well-rounded form of data that we can find to utilize. So um, happy to point you in that direction and share what we can. It's not, is that summarized in the freight plan itself, Erica? Not by region per se, but yes, as far as what's on what mode, values, et cetera, yes. Uh, just to expand on that, the reason transfer is not perfect because it does it by county. So you have to really look at major routes to know what routes are being utilized. I can tell you we have some heat maps that are um, pointing to exactly what you're talking about, Ron. Look, between Fort Collins, Denver, and Colorado Springs, that's where all of our freight moves um, in terms of the internal stuff. So sure, it might you know, deliver onto the Western Slope or somewhere along those lines, but it started in one of those three metro uh, locations. And 
Most of it's here. Um, so the, the busiest point for freight in Colorado is between here and Colorado Springs, and it's not close. Any further questions or comments for CLF staff? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation and uh, providing that overview. And great to hear we'll have some synergy coming up with the Dr. Cog freight plan as well. Uh, next item on the agenda packet is item number six. This is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, Attachment D in your packet. And I will hand it over to Andy Taylor, Manager of Regional Planning and Analytics. Well, thank you for your time and attention on this update about the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. I'm Andy Taylor. I get to provide leadership to both uh, regional planning and analytics teams here at Dr. Cog. So I'll just back up for a second here to MetroVision uh, before we get started talking about the Regional Housing uh, Needs Assessment. MetroVision is our regional plan. Uh, this version uh, that we're under now uh, was unanimously adopted by the Dr. Cog Board back in 2017. It lays out uh, desired outcomes uh, for the region related to growth and development, uh, mobility, the environment, uh, livability, and economic vitality. Uh, it doesn't replace local plans. Rather, uh, implementation follows a collective impact approach, recognizing that actions and efforts uh, at a local level and among different uh, local and regional partners uh, will be what helps make progress towards the desired outcomes in the plan. Uh, the foundation for the Regional Housing Needs Assessment uh, comes directly out of MetroVision uh, with a focus on housing options uh, and objectives to diversify that housing stock, uh, supply more attainable housing, and find more opportunities uh, for this diverse or attainable housing uh, with great access to our multimodal, our region's multimodal transportation network. Um, housing is directly related to Dr. Cog's role as a metropolitan planning organization uh, responsible for the federally required uh, metropolitan or regional transportation planning process. Uh, Congress even went so far as to clarify that this transportation planning process must consider housing uh, when uh, they last updated this section of code. Uh, last time I was here on the topic of housing, uh, we were working on adding a housing transportation coordination activity to our unified planning work program. Uh, partly in response to this language on the screen, uh, added by Congress to strengthen this connection between housing and transportation planning work, in addition to some other language that Congress added at that time. Uh, the work plan activity that we added uh, partially covers this housing assessment work uh, that we're about to get into. Uh, the housing needs assessment is just the first cog in this broader housing strategy and planning work. Uh, the assessment itself is broken up into two phases. Phase one focuses on analysis, analyzing uh, housing need. Phase two is focused on barriers and some initial transitions into uh, the strategy work. Uh, the ultimate goal is to see housing reflected in future plan updates here at Dr. Cog. We know there's lots of great assessment work underway locally. Uh, con consolidated planning, for example, is key to maintaining uh, many communities' access to federal housing funding. Uh, the key differences between that work and some of the other local work uh, is in purpose uh, related and scale. And that scale is also in terms of geography, uh, looking at the entire region, uh, because individuals' housing location decisions do cross jurisdictional boundaries uh, and do directly affect uh, everyday travel options and distances involved for households. But also scale in terms of time horizon. Uh, we're looking out 10 or 20 years in the future or more uh, with the opportunity to draw on some of our other forecasting work that we already do as part of the transportation planning process. In terms of steps, uh, we're starting by understanding the different components of need, uh, current needs, as well as needs forecast from that future growth. 
Uh, we then work to understand that need uh, across different income levels. And we're also working to determine that across different regional submarkets and even eventually showing what it might look like at a local level uh, if the region were to meet this uh, overall regional housing need. Uh, the project team's methodology accounts for current need in two buckets. There's underproduction through analysis of changes in household formation over time, and also accounting for homeless families that would not necessarily be found in many of the foundational data sets that we rely on in our household forecasting work, like the census. Uh, but rather than stop just with uh, trying to understand the shortage, uh, the method methodology also looks at making up for this current need alongside what it would take to keep up with projected uh, needs related to household growth. Uh, the project team also split the region up into five different uh, submarkets. The goal was for these to be contiguous, to reflect some commuting patterns uh, using a clustering algorithm to try and capture as high a number as possible of commute origins and destinations in one submarket and to be able to leverage data products that the Census Bureau has that allow for lots of custom data tabulation uh, to understand these different submarkets better. Uh, so while uh, if you can't quite tell where your community was on that map, uh, they're listed here. Unfortunately, some jurisdictions do cross into to multiple submarkets. Uh, but I will caveat that just for some, it may be a small sliver with a limited number of households. Um, I've got a series of slides uh, just to show how some of these submarkets differ in terms of uh, the housing market conditions based on recent and current data. So not looking forward quite yet. Housing tenure just means how many own their housing versus rent their housing. And we've got a significant number of renters in all submarkets despite the majority uh, that of households that own their home. Average sales price differs between the submarkets uh, with the high scene in the more mountainous west submarket, uh, but also fairly high in our, our north submarket. Uh, you'll also notice some parity between that central and southeast submarket. But also it's worth noting that all have followed very similar trends over the last two decades. Uh, things are a little closer on rents in terms of between the high and, and low uh, between the submarkets shown here, though that difference between about 1,500 and 1,900 is quite significant for a given household over a full year. Uh, cost burdening is when a household spends 30% or more of their income on housing. A severe burden is when that percentage goes over half of household income. Uh, this is something that many housing needs assessments look at and try to understand how many households may not be finding housing that's attainable or sustainable for their income level. Uh, while there is some variation between the submarkets, nearly half or more of households who rent are experiencing this cost burden. So now let's go back to the region as a whole and look forward. Um, Based on our work so far, the regional housing needed by 2035 is 216,000 homes. That's in addition to existing housing supply. Uh, the factor, that factors in current shortfalls in terms of underproduction and homelessness, as well as forecast household growth over that time. By 2050, uh, that need is over half a million. So let's break down that big half million number. Uh, here we're looking by income. So that's accounting for household income as it relates to area median income. Uh, forecasting demand into those different uh, income groups as compared to supply affordable at price points that would keep those households from being cost burdened. Uh, the biggest gap that you'll see here is forecast in that zero to 60% area median income between supply in that shaded area so this is what we're forecasting uh, to be the household supply available uh, affordably to those uh, income groups uh, with, and demand in that larger outlined area. So that's the type of data that we're working towards currently right now. 
uh, in terms of the schedule and where we're at. Uh, the first pieces of this work have focused on this type of analysis, uh, as well as some initial stakeholder engagement. The project team is working on right now on a summary uh, that will finalize and wrap up this analysis um, to be able to share it more broadly. Uh, the project team, uh, that we're then proceeding into uh, more stakeholder engagement in this upcoming phase uh, that we're uh, launching into really quickly here. And in this phase, the second phase, we're working to explore systemic barriers to sufficient housing construction uh, and initial or potential strategies uh, to start to meet the, the level of need that we're forecasting. Um, and we're aiming to bring all of these findings together uh, yet this June. And so we have some opportunities come, coming up. We have a series of stakeholder engagement uh, uh, sessions uh, to discuss barriers specifically. Uh, some of you may be interested in the opportunity we have coming up in person next week related to infrastructure, um, or you may have others back at your jurisdiction or agency that you could help extend the invite to. Uh, we also have um, some other opportunities that may be a fit for some of you that may be more on the advocacy development or service provision, provision side of things. Um, and we have uh, several, a series of other stakeholder engagement opportunities that I'd be happy to share as well. But um, again, thank you for your time. Um, I'm happy to turn it back over to the chair, but I'm also uh, available if there are any questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Andy, for that overview. Any uh, questions or comments for Dr. Cockstaff? I see Jessica Mickledest has her hand up. Hello, thanks. This is a really fascinating presentation. We just had one um, at CDOT from the state demographer that kind of aligned with some of the things that you're talking about. And I was just curious, when you're talking about how many units we need, did you take into account, is this assuming everything that's under construction or kind of planned for development today, including all of the condominiums you kind of see popping up around the region, or does this assume those, those are already under construction, so it's those are counted for, and we need, in addition to that, another... 216,000. So this wouldn't uh, this wouldn't account for anything that's under construction currently or planned. Uh, so that is a good number. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then just curious, um, the state tomographer was talking a lot about aging populations within particularly kind of the Dr. Cog area. And so does your information or study go into depth on type of housing or housing accommodation for for aging populations? Um, we'll be getting more into that as we get more into the strategy work about um, about what meets the needs of households based on age. Where age is already coming into play in our analysis is um, factoring into that income forecast, actually, as we are seeing and forecasting using the state demography data from the state demographer, um, as we're seeing more old, uh, households headed by older adults, that is changing the income distribution that we're expecting in this region. And so that is something that's already showing up uh, in, in these numbers in this initial analysis. But hopefully, yes, in the strategy work, we will be getting more at different types of housing and how to meet that need um, facing that trend. At Mormon. I noticed on your slide, if you go back to number nine or something like that, where you show the north and north central, et cetera, and on the next slide, you indicate that Thornton is in, in only the north. I, I was curious where that dividing line truly was uh, on your map. Since we surround Northland, I was just curious how that worked out. Yeah, um, but the project team was looking specifically at um, uh, households, um, so even though a jurisdiction may extend into one of these other areas, if there weren't households present in that area, it may not have shown up in that other area. These are following um, uh, public use micro sample areas, so um, they're, they're not some of the, the geographies folks may be more familiar with in terms of um, census tracts or census blocks, um, those types of things. So, yeah, um, I, I do want to, to where we will be working with the project team to get a, a tool that lets folks explore this map a little bit better to see quite where those boundaries fall. Um, it looks like that for that north central north area, some of that is following the county boundary on the on uh, the north of the north central line, but it is difficult to tell, yeah, where it is following. It looks like it may be following um, 
some of uh, the, the Broomfield boundary, um, it's not clear. I guess I was looking at the south boundary. Um, okay. I mean, across there. Uh, just, just curious how that all falls in there. Oh, the south boundary. Could, yeah, the the north, the south boundary of the north area. Just curious. Uh, some some uh, some street names or or uh, something on there. Look at that map. Back, thank you. Mike Silverstein. Oh, thank you. Um, two questions. First would be on slide 14. This would be on the rental cost burdening uh, topic. W what goes into the definition of burdened? Is it just the, the price of rent or is it everything associated with the home? What, what's, what goes into that? So for specifically for the rent side, it would be uh, what the Census Bureau calculates as gross rent. So this is part of what they're surveying for that. So it, it does, it may include quite a few things uh, in terms of uh, utilities, uh, but uh, for the most part, yeah, the, I think that is just uh, looking at rent uh, most often. So at that kind of that cut point of 30% is just the, the amount of rent that is, is charged versus all the, you know, the phone bill and the utility bill and the water bill, all those things added up. And then um, two more slides down. Um, that would be the, yes, this, the distribution need, the, um, the units for homelessness is just from a terminology perspective is in the you know past times we may have called that subsidized housing or rent support or low income housing is, is that equivalent or is there a you know is this for just unhoused folks or people who actually need some rent support what what goes into that definition so um the the units that we're reflecting for homelessness here um this is just a, a consequence of of how we're pulling them into the analysis long term the needs of, of uh, families and individuals experience homelessness, the, the home they need is going to look a lot like anyone else in that, in that income category. Um, so while there is need, I think, in the strategies as we start to get into what does that look like in terms of shelter or transitional units, um, there may be a need for more subsidized units in this category, in that zero to 60% AMI category. That is where um, we, we do tend to see more need for subsidy in general for all household types, not just those experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Christina Lane. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think I've, I'm getting an idea of just piggybacking off of the cost burden question is, was the H&T &T index, the housing and the transportation index used as like a jumping point for any need, recognizing more so that in our, throughout the region, in our more urban core, there's opportunities to reduce transportation costs. But in our more rural communities, um, where you know people are driving further, there's less access or no access to transit, um, just recognizing that that might impact housing considerations for the more rural communities in the, in the region. I think we're we're working with the project team to try and figure out if there's a way we can uh, do some comparison just on a map basis with the the housing and transportation uh, cost index. Um, I think it's difficult for us to fold it in directly because um, we are looking at individual households as they're represented in this data, and with that index, it's 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 a modeled indicator that's available at a given geography. But I think there are some things we want to make sure that we're speaking to, especially as we talk about uh, these regional submarkets and getting at where is that access to opportunity and where are those places that are experiencing, they may not be experiencing as high of a cost burden, but um, there may be more expenses on the transportation side of things. I right. There's at least three bills in the legislature right now focused on housing production, the ADUs, density around transit corridors, and uh, parking minimums. Is there a sense for how much each of those individually or cumulatively would impact 
our housing deficit, the 2035 and the 2050 numbers shown? Um, we haven't done that analysis directly as part of this work um, as, as how many units uh, would be produced by any of those, those bills directly, no, I'm sorry. Matt Callison. Thank you, Andy. Um, any thought, look, looking through a spatial lens and, and balancing jobs, uh, so as to cross the vehicle miles traveled, uh, affecting transportation costs, uh, uh, modes, uh, et cetera, on that. Probably more of a jobs housing, uh, employment wage scale. Uh, have, have the ability to look at where there's some deficits are and some needs. Yeah, so um, one of the, the uses that we have for these regional submarkets as part of this work is to start to explore some of that and look at where there are, where some of that need is being driven on the job side, uh, where it's being driven from a, a, a several different factors. And so trying to understand that connection between housing and transportation, for sure, is a big function of those regional submarkets. All right. I was just curious, um, how much does this study take into account some of the high growth there by the doctor that accounted for housing needs? Um, I'm trying to think if it would be accounted for. Um, so some of the high growth areas that are immediately outside the boundaries, um, those wouldn't necessarily be accounted for. We are trying to reflect and stay in line with the state demography office, um, but it is something to maybe at least, it, it could be worth um, uh, speaking to in the analysis itself because there are people who, if they did have housing options nearer, um, that it may, have a relationship to the, the housing choices they would make. And so um, there may be something we can speak to directly at, but it's not included in the analysis per se. Any further questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? On Papstar. Thank you so much, Andy, for sharing. Hopeful. Um, might want to mention that um, our hope is to come back to another TAC meeting to do a little bit of a um, maybe deeper dive sort of working session discussion through some of the sort of intricate relationships between this housing work and our transportation choices and investment and priorities. And then just to circle back, I think Jessica had the very first question. I, um, just to clarify, so I, this graph is the, a good example. It's about 500,000 total units need of the, between now and 2050. Not sure if Jessica quite was getting to the question, but what would we, ex kind of based on sort of our trends, our trends with the market production of units overall, I think that might have been what partly what Jessica was getting at. How much of that sort of future need might be met sort of with our average trends we've seen in terms of housing unit production, ignoring the fact that we we think that sort of we're, we're missing certain segments or there's a misalignment between the type of housing and, and particular, but overall of that amount. The good news is that looking back um, with the project team on um, our housing construction trends is that um, we are building a lot as a region. We are, we are, it's just maybe not in every regional submarket to the same level and also in every income group to the, to the level of need that we might have. So, um, I think that'll come across in our strategy work pretty, uh, more clearly, uh, where, um, we're, we're sitting in a, a slightly better position than maybe some other regions throughout the country where, um, housing production just overall uh, is an uphill climb. Um, I think we do are sitting in a different position. Thank you. Thanks for this presentation. Uh, information is really helpful. Um, I think piggybacking on Ron's question, I think it might be helpful for us to understand um, historic trends and then current housing stock today. So when we're talking about adding over 200,000 new homes over the next 10 years, what does that mean relative to not just the inventory today, but also those building trends over those 5, 10, 15 year periods? 
Thanks. Thanks. Any further questions or comments for Dr. Kopstad? Wonderful. Thank you, Andy, for that overview, and thank you for the robust discussion from the TAC, and um, appreciate Dr. Cog's work on this um, really important issue for our community. Um, as Andy noted, there are some upcoming engagement opportunities that were in the packet there coming up over the next few weeks, so please look into those and um, share that within your organization, agencies, and partners and community. Um, next uh, item is item number eight. This is the Federal Greenhouse Gas Performance Measure. This is attachment... Oh, sorry, I skipped one. <laughs> Moving, sorry, thank you, Cam. Uh, number seven, taking action on regional vision zero. This is attachment E in your packet, and I will hand it over to Emily Kleinfelter, safety and regional vision zero planner. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the safety regional vision zero planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, this is probably my second or so time I've come before you all today to talk about this. So. We're just um, bringing this to you all today to give you another update before we bring it to you for your approval next month. Um, so if you're not familiar with um, why are we updating, well, um, as most everybody is probably very well aware, um, the numbers are not going in the direction we want them to. Um, serious injuries and fatalities are continuing to increase. Um, we also want to make sure we're aligning with the best practice for transportation safety um, approaches, and that's the safe system approach. Um, you will see that most of you should have in front of you uh, sort of a complimentary packet to your agenda packet about the safe system approach that hopefully you can digest um, at a later time. Another thing is that there's a lot more funding opportunities through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and then last but not least, I think one of the most important is that we continue to hear from you all that there's um, more more need for this to be a focus and more want for collaboration to try and find solutions to the um, to these challenges. So again, um, I mentioned the packet that you have in front of you today about the safe system approach. Um, this is uh, sort of the guiding, uh, guiding approach for Dr. Cog and not just Dr. Cog, but really uh, USDOT, uh, CDOT, all of really uh, the, all of the transportation industry is taking on this approach away from the traditional ease to the safe system approach. Um, so these guiding principles are that death and serious injury are unacceptable. Um, humans make mistakes, you know, we are, we are fallible creatures, we are not perfect. Um, and we're also very vulnerable creatures. We um, can only withstand a certain um, amount of kinetic energy, right? Like we, especially outside of a vehicle, um, only have so much protection. Um, but that responsibility is shared, not just uh, with the roadway users, but also with us here sitting at the table, um, sort of higher upstream. There's a lot of responsibility on those of us who are um, creating and have um, a more power in the transportation system. Um, and so with that, it's to say that safety is proactive. Um, that means that really instead of like looking at crash data for how to react to um, safety, we're, we're looking at where are the risks and being more systemic. Um, and, and again, being systemic means that redundancy is crucial. That means that we are not just um, doing one hotspot implementation, but instead if we see that there's an issue in a community, we're seeing where else are there other ways that we can um, address that issue before another issue may happen in a similar part of the community. So the safe system elements are really brought down to these four core ways of um, addressing those principles. And th so those four elements are safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care. And none of this could work together without a, safe, a supporting safety culture that is in place that really first um, puts the safety first and foremost in, of, of all roadway users in um, our decisions when we're thinking about where to put our investments. So that brings us to today and why we are here talking to you about the update to taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Um, many of you might be familiar with this plan. We adopted it back in uh, June of 2020, 
And it's a really amazing document that staff put together with our consultant team back then. Um, and, and it contains a lot of really useful information. Um, but we were not taking a, a crack at updating all of this right now. We were taking a closer look at um, what we call Chapter 6, the implementation plan, which is um, the core sort of beef of the document that is where are um, where are we going to be focusing our time and resources? What are those objectives and how are we going to be achieving them? Um, and then another thing to highlight is that in the meantime, since adopting the plan in 2020, we also um, worked with our GIS team to create a regional Vision Zero story map. So we'll touch on that more in a moment. So as I mentioned, this is sort of the structure that we've been working ourselves through. Um, we initially started with sort of a status check where are we? Where have we gone? Uh, or sorry, where have we come from since 2020? What all have we accomplished? And I'll uh, mention some of those big accomplishments in just a moment. Uh, and then we worked ourselves, or then we worked in uh, virtual settings to do these objective workshops and followed up with surveys to folks. And then lastly, we actually got together here in this room and um, got to have an in-person prioritization workshop, uh, which helped us really identify the short-term, mid-term, and long-term. Um, goals, or sorry, actions for each of the objectives based on the feedback of all of the member governments and our other partners. Like comment period, it actually wraps up tomorrow um, and it has been out for 30 days, getting public comment from um, both member governments and the public. And then once we take all of the, that feedback, um, we will be coming back to you actually just in March for approval and then taking it to the board for their approval in April. Um, so I will be running through that timeline again at the end, but um, I wanted to notice the object, or sorry, talk about the objective workshops. Here is sort of a little uh, screenshot of what we, the activity that we worked on in these virtual workshops. Um, we used a software called Mural, if anybody's familiar with it. Um, some people found it a little complicated. I know that it was maybe a little tricky and, and a little too much tech at times, but we actually thought that it was a super useful resource for trying to create an engagement um, tool by being, but still being virtual. And um, it allowed us to establish sort of the impact of each action as well as the difficulty to implement. And so that helps us really um, guide our way forward of selecting what were the timeline years for these actions. And then, as I mentioned, that was our next uh, sort of step was doing the prioritization workshop where we got together here in this room and, and decided, okay, we've taken a look at how hard it is to implement and what's the impact of these actions. Now, where does it fall on our timeline? Because we only have so much capacity and so much, you know, so much resources to be able to do all this. Um, and so I worked with a lot of your uh, staff and other folks here in the room to identify what are our short-term, mid-term, and long-term um, actions. And so here's some of the takeaways here, which um, I think one of the most important ones to me is to take advantage of existing programs instead of creating new ones. I think, you know, we've got a lot of really great things that are already existing, whether it's within your own communities, some of our partners at CDOT or RTD. And instead of us trying to come in and create a whole new program, we should be looking at to collaborate with other partners and, you know, not recreate the wheel. So before I jump into where are we headed, what are those actions that we want to uh, focus on in the near term, I wanted to speak to some of the, where have we been, those actions that we are really excited that we've accomplished since adopting the plan in 2020. And um, one of the, the really, really big highlights I'd like to call out is our Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. Um, I know I've talked to many partners throughout the, my time here about how much of a, a great tool it is, and I myself use it all the time. Um, and so we developed that, of course, over the back in 2021. Um, and then we worked with a consultant team after that to then create a prioritization analysis, which then uh, really helps us narrow down uh, creating sort of medium, high, and low priority segments across the region where we know to focus our funding and resources to improve accessibility and mobility and safety in the region. Another really big highlight in that sort of data space um, is the creation of our Regional Vision Zero story map. Um, again, this taking action on Regional Vision Zero plan is a um, 
just a PDF document that lives on online, or if you have a hard copy and you're lucky like me, um, but that's all it is. And I, I don't know about you all, but sometimes that's not the most useful resource. And so we saw a way to complement it by creating a regional Vision Zero story map, um, which takes the um, the story map, uh, sorry, the crash profile analysis work that we do in taking action on region, regional Vision Zero, and it creates it into a more web based platform that allows you to um, more visually explore the crash profiles in the region and um, identify or some of the potential countermeasures. So like I said, we're, that's where we've been, some great things we've accomplished. Now I'm gonna talk about some key actions that we wanna accomplish within the next zero to two years. These are key immediate actions and we have six objectives. And so I'm gonna run through uh, one action for each objective. Some of them are different levels of impact you'll see here or different levels of difficulty to implement. Um, and that's that's kind of on purpose, right? We can't have all super impactful, super hard to implement actions because there's only so much staff and resources here to get the job done. Um, but starting off strong, I think that we are hearing you all and loud and clear that we wanna address dangerous behaviors on the roadways um, and so that means creating a forum to bring together all different types of partners, um, that maybe not traditional partners in the transportation system to create um, regular safety meetings of all of these different stakeholders to discuss ways to find solutions to address these dangerous behaviors, whether it's driving or whatever, whatever other dangerous roadway behaviors we're seeing, we need to get our heads together and maybe think of not always traditional approaches to um, finding the solution to it. And it's always not gonna be a one, um, one solution fits all for every community, right? And so that's where we believe that this forum could be a really great way to start finding that solution. So looking at improving collaboration, uh, sorry, improving collaboration between allied agencies, uh, we also, want to uh, promote the safe system approach and vision zero training or educational opportunities to our local governments, to community organizations, and especially to media outlets. We wanna make sure we're getting the word out there. Um, I, I feel like you know we can do as much as we can around education, but it's making sure that that message is being reiterated through our media whenever something does come to them. Um, and so we, we wanna make sure it's a full systemic approach, right? We can't just be, um, talking about it within our own communities, we have to try and think outside of our communities. But we also um, have to think about the, the roadways themselves. And so for looking at the designing and retrofitting roadways to prioritize safety, um, we have identified the creation of a quick build toolkit would be something of use to the region, um, something that would provide guidance on design, traffic measures, um, to improve safety. And then looking at objective four to improve data collection and reporting. Um, so I mentioned that we have those crash profiles um, for the region based on our area types. Well, we want to make sure that we are doing that every, that's a routine analysis that we're performing. So um, our, our goal is to initiate that in the next year to two years, the next analysis of those crash profiles, update them and then make sure that we've got a system in place to routinely update those every three to five years. Objective five, increasing funding and resources. We'd like to continue evaluating the transportation improvement program criteria to further prioritize safety projects that are on the regional high injury network that address those key crash profiles I just mentioned um, or otherwise reduce fatal and serious injury crashes. That's something that is gonna take a lot of collaboration with many other folks in this room and um, people within some of the other or staff at Dr. Cog, but we know that um, really if, if we're able to increase and create sustainable um, sources of funding, then that really could help shift um, and push the needle in our direction. And then lastly, objective six, improving data collect, oh, that's not the right, improving data collection and reporting, that's not correct. This one is supposed to be um, increasing our legislative support. And so this is looking to support legislation to increase funding and evaluate reallocation of existing funding to safety projects to create a reliable dedicated funding stream. Um, like I just mentioned, we need dedicated sources of funding that are 
reliable and not something we're always having to go after grants for safety projects. Um, and then back to the timeline that I mentioned, we are here right now talking about this progress report. Um, I will be back with you all in March to bring this to you all for your approval. Um, the public comment period, as I mentioned, wraps up tomorrow. And then uh, we will be taking all of that, those comments and feedbacks, um, making sure there's any remediation that needs to be done to the document, bringing it to you in March. April, we'll go to RTC and then um, as well as go to board and hopefully everybody approves it and get started and um, get the ball rolling. Quite frankly, we're obviously not gonna wait uh, you know, to be doing this. We're doing this work still. We, we, the Regional Vision Zero Work Group meeting, uh, we just had that last week um, or two weeks ago now. And so um, you know, we're not waiting till this is approved to continue working on safety, um, but this is just, we, we of course need to dot the I's and cross the T's to get everyone's approval to make sure that um, you know, this new action plan is the, the right direction that we want to be moving forward on. So with that, um, I wanted to invite you, if you all are interested in participating in that Regional Vision Zero Workgroup meeting or somebody from your staff uh, is interested in participating and you're not already invited, we um, would love to have you. So email me or Cam Kennedy and we can get you on that email list. Um, we used to And we will also be doing at least one, most likely two site visits this year. Um, and so if you know of a potential, if you're interested in hosting one, you know of a potential project or activity that you wanna highlight in your community related to Vision Zero and safety, let me know. We'd be more than happy to coordinate and come out and check out your community. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Thank you for that overview of the Regional Vision Zero update and the status. Is there any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Uh, Justin Schmitz. Yeah, Emily, I just wanted to highlight, I think this is a really good balance, right, of trying to find all the good work that's been done, but create these sort of, you know, new immediate actions to help us, I think as a region, move forward. The one I wanted to highlight, you talked about objective one, which was to sort of, what is it, collaboratively address dangerous behaviors on the roadways. Currently, I'm working with a student driver in my own house all the time, and every time we go and drive, uh -huh. there's a significant amount of aggressive and, and dangerous behavior on the roads, right? And I do think, you know, everyone in this room, we do, we're working very hard to design our systems to be safer, um, but it also needs a buy-in, right, from the users of the system. And whatever we can all do collectively with the partners, right, to really get that collective buy-in, I think it's going to be a really big trigger. Um, there's sort of this inverse nature sometimes. We do all these great improvements, and then we make those aggressive drivers potentially sometimes feel they need to be more aggressive, right? So how do we find that balance that we, we really work through it? Um, I just think that some of us sometimes get lost in all the details when we're working on design. So I like that objective, and I hope uh, we all see success on that. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say traffic safety culture is something that we at Dr. Cog are working to address more. It's sort of that missing puzzle piece. You know, we've got um, all of these other ways as far as infrastructure or even education, um, but traffic safety culture is, again, it's going to require a full paradigm shift of the way we talk and think about safety. And, and honestly, it means that I, I encourage you all, when you leave here and you're navigating around, you know, how are you be, being a safe, you know, user on the roadway system? Are you not just yourself, but maybe when you're in the car with your family or your friends, are you keeping them accountable? You know, if you see them using their phone a little bit at the stoplight or something, or if you, even if it's those little things, if you become that naggy Nelly a little bit or whatever, it, it's making our roadway system safer. And it's, that level of sort of systemic being the person within your small community that's that's teaching and and continuing that conversation that's going to help create the the larger thank you justin well said thanks <laughs> Brad <Mabir? clears throat> hi emily nice to see you <clears throat> um i just also want to say as someone who biked here from the central park neighborhood thank you for what you're doing and I'm also happy to be one of those naggy Nellies too, if we need it, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, Michelle Molinakis. 
Um, I just wanted to give a kudos to Emily and Cam and the rest of the Dr. Cog team. This, progress, this project has been extremely collaborative, and I feel like you all have listened to the back in discussions that have um, and I really see what people were really concerned about reflected in your immediate actions, and I just uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Further questions or comments for Dr. Cogstad? Wonderful. Thank you, Emily, for that update. And again, public comment closes tomorrow, so you still have some time to get those in. We look forward to seeing you again next month. Next item on the agenda is item number eight, Federal Greenhouse Gas Performance Measures. This is attachment F in your packet. And I will hand it over to Alvin Badal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Program Manager. Chair, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I am bringing before you all a new performance measure that CDOT and Dr. Cog will be subject to later this year. This is part of our federal performance management program. Y'all have seen a version of this graphic before when our colleague Lauren was presenting the safety targets, whereas that was PM1 we were discussing. I will be highlighting a new performance measure under PM3. It's the largest of the performance areas. It covers system performance, freight, and CMAC. Um, for the five areas, those are broken down broken into whether we're reporting to the Federal Highway Administration or the Federal Transit Administration. Each of these came online at a various point after 2017, and they all have different data requirements, methodology pieces, reporting expectations for them. Like I mentioned, PM3 is the largest of the performance areas. Within that one, there are four sub areas, traffic congestion reduction, on-road mobile source emissions, travel time reliability, and freight reliability. I'll be touching on what is previously called the travel time reliability sub area, but it does include a new performance measure related to the percent change in tailpipe, tailpipe CO2 emissions on the national highway system. So a quick overview, since this is new for staff or stakeholders, um, the area that we're setting this target for is all mainline highways on the interstate and non-interstate national highway system. The following slide will provide a graphic of what that actually looks like in our metropolitan planning organization area. The data we're using, there are two, fat, two pieces that come from the Federal Highway Administration. One is emissions factors by fuel type, and then the other is fuel cells data. And then we'll combine that with our vehicle miles travel data to set these targets. There is only one performance measure, whereas some might have two, four, five. This is just the one performance measure, the percent change in on-road tailpipe CO2 emissions on the national highway system relative to 2022. So that'll be our baseline year. Calculation is actually pretty simple. It's the emissions on the national highway system in the current year, subtracted with the emissions on the national highway system from the reference years. So that'll be 2022 for this first one. We divide that by the emissions on the national highway system in 2022 to get a decimal. We multiply that times 100 to get our percent change. In terms of federal guidance, this is actually different from what we have presented before on you before to y'all related to our other federal performance measures. In this case, targets must be declining. So looking at that 2022 baseline year, we do have to set targets that show a reduction. MPOs and state DOTs do still have the option to set targets that make sense for their region, make sense for the state, but the only required guidance is that they do have to be declining in some form. As with many of the rest, we can support CDOT's targets or we can set our own for the region. We've taken a uh, Mixed approach on that, depending on what the particular target is. For safety, we have historically set our own for the region. For infrastructure condition, like pavement and bridge, we've historically supported the state's targets. There is no penalty to CDOT or Dr. Cog if they do not meet these targets. Um, no financial penalty, no funding restriction. There will be additional reporting requirements on the state. And as an MPO, we could face additional scrutiny in our federal certification process that occurs every four years. Like I mentioned, I wanted to highlight what is the National Highway System within the Dr. Cog Metropolitan Planning Organization area. So the dark blue on this map are what we are setting targets for. Um, underlaid to that, you can see the full roadway network that actually makes up our region. 
Um, we are only setting targets, looking at emissions on the blue network within this map. And even related to that, we're just looking at the mainline highway piece. So we're not looking at connecting ramps, on ramps. So any emissions that are occurring on that aren't part of this target setting process. For Dr. Cog itself, we will have 180 days after CDOT sets their targets. Our ultimate deadline will be September 25th of this year, so we'll be coming back before you all a couple times um, to help with target setting and then through the recommendation and approval process. We have to establish these through resolution. That's nothing new for Dr. Cog. All of these go before the board um, and then get signed by the chair and submitted in a formal submittal packet to the state DOT and our federal partners. As I mentioned, we have the option of supporting the states or setting our own for the region. Um, one of the options that was provided by our federal partners is we could use our share of the state's DMT as a proxy for emissions in the state. So an option we can evaluate if we decide to go the route of setting our own for the region. Coordination with CDOT is encouraged. Um, we've been doing this with all of our different targets that we've set uh, in the region at the state. Uh, staff from CDOT are with us right now to help out with any questions that might come up or speak to their efforts. And there will be no significant progress determinations for Dr. Cog, um, not just this first piece, but moving forward. So uh, we will not be uh, facing any penalties for not meeting the targets that we're setting. A couple points that staff will be considering. Greenhouse gas is not a new conversation for us here in the region. Um, we do have two other performance targets that we are familiar with, have set historically. Metrovision's surface transportation greenhouse gas performance measure is one. And then the most recent one that we're familiar with is the state's greenhouse gas planning standard, those reduction levels over those four analysis years in million metric tons. This will just be a third version of a greenhouse gas performance measure. So for some of our short-term realistic federal targets, we do align them with some of our longer-term aspirational goals as they might be outlined in different plans, Metrovision, state or federal processes. That'll be a consideration staff takes into account when it comes time to determine whether we want to set our own for the region or support the state's targets. Next steps, um, we briefed the Regional Transportation Committee earlier this month. Uh, we'll be going before the board in March. CDOT has a deadline of the end of March to establish their targets and report them. After that deadline of March 29th, our own time, time starts. Um, and so through March through September, we'll be working with CDOT um, internally to figure out what it makes the most sense for us, whether we're setting our own targets for the region or supporting the states. And then our ultimate deadline will be September 25th. So we'll be coming back before y'all later this year for an ultimate recommendation to the RTC. I know that was a very high-level overview, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, any questions for Dr. Cog's staff? Mike Silverstein. Thank you very much, um, and, and thank you, Alvin. Uh, will there be a, uh, a kind of a work group process here at TAC or in another forum, yeah, kind of at this, um, you know, I, I would call it maybe a junior level before things move up to RTC and, and the full board. How, how will the goals be developed and will we have opportunity for, you know, um, you know substantial input? Yeah, so uh, once, the, once CDOT determines their route in terms of targets, staff will be looking internally to see what makes potentially the most sense to bring before our committees in terms of um, information gathering. Where should we be heading as a region in terms of supporting or setting our own for the region? Um, I'm, I'm thinking of just our safety targets. That was a really important one for us in the region to be setting really aggressive aspirational targets compared to where the state TOT was when these were first rolled out. So that'll be part of the conversation we have with our committees internally and staff is what makes sense for us uh, and, and how do, we, how do we get there with target setting? So I would say yes, we'll have conversations with this body, RTC and the board prior to a recommendation and approval process. Okay, great, looking forward to it, thanks. Mr. Mormon? How, how will this greenhouse gas standard or, or align with the state's already adopted greenhouse? Minor, is this additional or less um, just curious? Um, where I'm headed is it's hard to have two different two different targets. It would be to have one target. Just asking the question of does it use the same things that we are using for greenhouse gas or is the Fed the federal government off on a different tangent for greenhouse gases, et cetera? 
Yep, so that is the question staff are having right now is how we align these short-term realistic targets with what we could already have in place either through Metro Vision or the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction levels that we do have to meet. Um, the data pieces that we do have are set by the Fed, so they are different um, than what is going into either the, the Metro Vision target or our state greenhouse gas emission reduction level compliance runs. And so um, we recognize that having three different greenhouse gas performance targets makes conversations um, a little confusing. Um, using different data, uh, a quirk of this one is just the national highway system piece, um, our, our air quality related to the federal guidelines, and then our state emission reduction levels are regional analyses, so there's already um, discrepancies right there, but that'll be part of the conversation we have as staff is, should we align these with, with a longer term process like the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction levels? Um, the state's also having those, their own conversations with that as well. And so depending on how they end up uh, moving in a direction of a target setting, uh, we could ultimately just support their target if it's in line with a larger process, um, or we could set our own if we think we need to be more aggressive as a region compared to the state. Marvin? Yeah, so you said that we're using the national standards for CO2 or, or NO2 or whatever or whatever the average is across the nation, yet Colorado has much higher standards uh, on their emissions testing, et cetera. So that doesn't seem to, that seems to penalize us, if, if you will, in of Colorado. Is that a, a fair statement or is, or is this new cars or what age of fleet are they at the federal level? Because some place out in the middle of Kansas may have a totally different standard than Colorado. Yep, so uh, the emissions factors that come from the feds uh, are by fuel type. So there isn't a uh, like, um, like wheat detail on that. Um, for, for these national measures, the, the federal government, USDOT, has aimed for some consistency just for an apples to apples comparison between state DOTs, between regions. Uh, when the notice of proposed rulemaking was provided, Dr. Cog did provide comments related to some of these quirks in the ultimate uh, descriptions, definitions of these different data pieces. Uh, but ultimately, uh, for, for consistency, uh, the, the USDOT did go with these what are very high, broad measures for an apples to apples comparison between state DOTs and regions across the nation. Michelle Malinakis. Um, I have just a general question. Um, one of the things that we get into as we're doing HG projects is there oftentimes there's a benefit to capacity increase that reduces delay in GHG and then over time that capacity fills up and you're back at delay with additional capacity, which is how is is this you guys approaching this in the plan and if so how so this is just one piece of our larger federal performance management program. Um, there are other pieces that speak to traffic congestion, um, shifting travel to like non-single occupancy vehicle. Um, and like I mentioned, this is just our, our federal measures, which are really short-term, realistic. Uh, we also rely on our Metro Vision plan that has its own performance measures targets that speak to more about the quality of life that we want to achieve in the region. So ultimately, it's about balancing all of those different aspects. Um, with our federal ones, we do try to, as much as possible, align them with established vision that are already part of our regional um, aspirational goals and outcomes, so we're not making anything new. Um, I would say um, we, we recognize that there is that balance in capacity versus future congestion. Um, it's all about what quality of life do you want to achieve in the region. Any further questions or discussion for Dr. Cog? Thank you so much, Alvin. Thank you for that introduction to the new federal greenhouse gas performance measures, and we look forward to more discussions over this summer. And we will move on to item number nine, rebuilding American infrastructure with sustainability and equity, also known as RAISE. And this is attachment G in your packet, and I'll hand it over to Jacob Rieker. 
Yep, thank you, Chair Grant. So as is our practice, each time a notice of funding opportunity or NOFO is released under the bipartisan infrastructure law for a transportation discretionary grant, um, we ask um, potential project sponsors or potential project submitters, grant submitters, um, to you know, sort of fill out a form to just kind of let the region know we want to be transparent, we want to be well coordinated in this region. Uh, so every time one of these comes out, we ask folks to just kind of let us know if you're considering submitting for, in this case, a raise grant. Um, so we have collected those. We received six, um, six sort of um, notifications about potential raise grants that might be submitted. Um, they're due on Wednesday, so we've collected those um, in the packet. I'm not going to go through them individually. We're not looking for presentations from the sponsors, but the point is, again, transparency and regional coordination. So we want you all to see what your maybe neighbors or um, partners across the region are considering in terms of um, potential project submittals for this grant program and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair Grant. Thank you, Jacob. Any questions about the raise grants or the submitted applications? Thank you. Really appreciate Dr. Cog's efforts to um, collect that information and share it with the, with the entire TAC and the Dr. Cog organization. Um, item number 10, uh, this is member comments and other matters. Um, we have the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group update, but I believe our representative person is not here. Do we have anyone else? Ron Dobsdorf, hand over to you. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, yes, I'm filling in. Carson Priest wasn't able to make the meeting today. He is your liaison to the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group. They met on February 6th. Um, they uh, considered presentations and had discussions around artificial intelligence and camera sensors for safety and infrastructure improvements. There were three presentations from partners, including Arapahoe County, CDOT, and the City of Centennial. Um, each presentation focused on how new camera technology uh, can be and is being used to improve uh, roadway safety, enforce traffic violations, and stream structure improvements. And please don't ask me any questions. I wasn't there. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Appreciate the update. Uh, are there any other uh, member comments or other matters that um, TAC members or alternates would like to bring to the TAC? Mike Silverstein. Thank you very much. And, and Thank you for another opportunity to speak today. Um, just a, a request um, for the uh, March meeting. Um, hoping to uh, to get a briefing or at least an update on um, Dr. Cog's uh, climate um, uh, planning efforts in the grant program under the um, the Priority Climate Action Plan, the CCAP program. Wondering if that's um, something we could squeeze into the agenda for uh, March. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mike, thanks for bringing that up. We'll, we'll take a look at our agenda for March. Um, and because I know that our staff did do a presentation on the uh, priority climate action plan here at TAC. I can't remember if it was the last meeting or the meeting before, but um, appreciate that request. And we'll look at we'll look at sort of the next couple of meetings and see when that our board, just for your information, our board last week did approve and adopt the priority climate uh, climate pollution reduction grant program from the EPA. So that's the first big milestone that was due to be, that had to be submitted by March, that has to be submitted by our, March 1st. So the board approved that at their meeting last week. Um, and then um, our, our staff in collaboration with a lot of, a lot of your jurisdictions around the region and agency partners are currently working feverishly towards an implementation Grant um, application under the implementation portion of that grant program applications due April 1st. So uh, we'll we'll see when we can get an update, Mike. I will accommodate the next meeting, but I, I can't make a promise. Well, well thank you, and and uh, congratulations for spitting out uh, two complex acronyms over and over without uh, without messing up. I sure did. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other um, updates or comments or other matters from the TAC? Okay. Seeing none, uh, our next meeting will be March 25th. If you did not see, if you did not sign in, please do check in at the back table. Make sure you find that sign-in sheet or find Dr. Cog's staff to be sure you're registered as attending. Thank you for your participation today, and we will see you uh, March 25th, 2024. And the meeting is now adjourned at two. I'm sorry. 3.10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Oh,